be going. Okay. Um, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, time appropriate greetings to you wherever you're joining us from in in the world. Um, and it's Podchat Live episode number 84. Um, and we are super excited to be joined by Dr. Bronnie Lennox-Thompson. Hi, Bronnie. How are you doing? I'm very good, thank you, despite the, the early hour. <laughs> yeah. the end of those, but, <laughs> for some of us. <laughs> yep. yep. Bronnie's uh, down in uh, Christchurch in New Zealand, so it's very early in the morning for us. So we're always grateful when someone uh, is willing to give up their breakfast to join us. And um, <laughs> just in case anyone's not too aware of Bronnie, and, and our absolute goal of this evening is to, to, if you're not, to make you aware of Bronnie and her work so you can go away and read it afterwards. But a, 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 an introduction that's, that's very brief and doesn't do her career any justice at all, but she is an occupational therapist uh, by background has a master's degree in psychology, a PhD in uh, living well or coping with pain. Um, she's uh, affiliated with the uh, University of Otago, I believe. I mean, there's just so much, you know, so much stuff. We're going to link to some of her research below um, in the comments. We're going to talk about it as we go on. And the ultimate or overarching theme, I would say, is, is why patients seek care. So, you know, just really unpicking, uh, you know, or looking behind the curtain, so to speak, about why people come to see us and that interaction when they see us. And for those in the UK who are members of the College of Podiatry, who get podiatry now um, dropping through their letterbox uh, once a month, uh, Bronnie's actually written something for our journal, which will be arriving in the next couple of months as well. So this is like a nice little introduction to that. So... Um, Bronnie, forgive me for, for just bombarding you with questions, and they might not be in a logical <laughs> order, but I just felt like a, a, a reasonable place to start might be before, before the patient has even come to see us. So the person who, who perhaps isn't booked into our diary yet, or perhaps they, they, they're booked in Monday and we haven't seen them yet. And let's just yeah. put ourselves in their shoes for, for, for a little while, pardon the pun, and sort of, could you speak to some of the beliefs that sort of underpin where they're at and why they've, why they've decided to book in? Yeah, I mean, everybody's decisions will be slightly different, but if, imagine this is me um, and I'm going to come and see you. And I'm a, I'm a silversmith, so on my spare time, I spend hours standing in my studio doing, doing my thing. And as I stand there, I've got this pain in my foot and I'm actually telling the truth here. <laughs> so I have, I have, toe pain or just yeah, kind of toe pain after I've been standing for a while. Now this has been happening for months and I haven't done anything about it. And I would not be, um, un this is not an uncommon situation. And something has told, triggered my thoughts that I need to do something about this. And for example, it could be, um, I'm about to go on a long tramp hike for those that know don't know what tramping is <laughs> um and and i want to know that i'm going to be able to make it or i am not sure what's going on and i'm a bit worried that it's going to mean i'll end up crippled so first of all i have to work out that is this experience that i've got is it going to hang around long enough for me to make it worth for me to come and see somebody i'm going to have to work out whether this is just normal and something to be expected or is it weird and if it starts to be on the weird end then i've got to decide who do i go see you know who who out of all the people that i know of should i go and see should i go and see my gp should i go and see a physio should i go and see a podiatrist and in that thinking there's a whole lot of social stuff about what my community expects and my experiences so if I am in a family that um, go to see the doctor all the time, I'll probably go to see the doctor. But if I'm from a place where podiatrists are known and I can see the signs out and I know that they look after feet and I've got this pain, then I might choose to come and see a podiatrist. So there's, in thinking about when somebody comes to see you, there's been a whole train of thinking. First of all, recognising there's something going on here and that it's hanging around long enough to make it useful for me to see somebody. Secondly, there'll be some kind of trigger that says, now's the time. Because people don't do anything initially. Um, it could be that this is really unusual and it's really intense, and so I think I need to do it now. Or it could be like me, it's been niggling away at me for months and I've got this event that I want to be able to do. 
So some reason. And for pain problems, very often it's not the pain intensity. It's the fact that it stops me from doing stuff I want to do. High heel wearing. Lord knows why. Um, and then I've got to have this familiarity with the professional that I think I might see. And I'll have a hunch in my mind about what I think might be going on. And I'll have a hunch about what this professional or these groups of professionals do. And all of that is communicated in our world through social means, like it could be social media, or it could be um, friends that have talked to us, or it could be something I've read in a journal or a, or a newspaper. So all of that is informing me before I turn up to see you. And then I've got this expectation of what I think you're going to do and what I prioritise as my most important thing. And if you, you know, when you come to see me, you'll be assuming a whole lot of stuff about me. I'm a 56-year-old woman who's not overweight, but probably got a bit of osteoarthritis going on. And, you know, I'm not diabetic, but I could be. And all of those sorts of things will be featuring in your mind, as well as your understanding of what happens with the people that you see. And then we meet. It's like, love at first sight. <laughs> or not. <laughs> And, and like Cinderella, I'll put my foot out and you'll have a look. But um, it's at that point that we check whether our agendas are aligned or not. That's where things can start to fall apart. But all of that hidden stuff, if we don't unpack it a little bit, we can be talking at cross purposes. And that's fascinating. Then you wonder why this person doesn't bother coming back. Because maybe you've addressed something that you thought was really important, but that wasn't why the person wanted to come and see you in the first place. Yeah. yeah. And, and just leaning back on something you said there, which I've, I've heard you say before, um, which is definitely something that I, I didn't consider you, you met several years ago, is that it's not the pain intensity that brings people to see you, or it's rarely the pain intensity, which, it, which yeah. was fascinating to me. It's more there's a functional prohibition of something or there's a goal that, that can't be met or there's a concern there because certainly in the model that that many of us as health professionals are taught is okay someone comes in they're here because of pain and we, again we're projecting our assumptions here they're here because of pain you better quickly ask them what that pain is out of 10 and oh my yeah. goodness oh my goodness it's an eight or a nine all of our our management strategies now are focused on getting that eight to a number south of eight um, yeah. and, and it's quite clear that that, that isn't just a, a bit of a simplification of what's going on. It's, it's potentially a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah, and it, it is interesting because our assumptions are that pain intensity drives treatment seeking. And, and when you've got intense, severe pain, it probably is because that's a signal to the person that, oh, my God, I don't know what's going on. But, but for most people, and I'm, back pain is the sort of archetypal problem that we that we've developed this understanding from you know you have a you have an ache or a pain and then you want to wait to see whether it's going to hang around is it something that i need to be worried about and so for foot pain it would be very similar is it a new thing is it is it an old thing that's gone away in the past and if it's gone away in the past, why is it hanging around this time? And how much is it getting in the way? Do I put up with it just knowing that I'm getting older? Or do I think, oh, hold on, I changed my shoes. I better do something different. Or is it because I'm about to do something that I want to be able to do? And when do I notice that it's sore? And for me, with my, my foot pain, it's when I've been silversmithing for a day. And that's something I love to do and if anything that gets in the way of my silversmithing or going for a long tramp those are going to be things that matter to me and that's what prompts me to come and see somebody and that's very common but we don't even think about it it's fascinating question. isn't it sorry Bronnie a, qu a question without notice and maybe a little bit out of sequence here <laughs> what, what role does Google play in that process oh well it's got to matter enough for the person to Google so if you just think, oh, this is kind of normal for me, or oh, everybody has a bit of foot pain when they've been walking for a day, or oh, I've been wearing new shoes, so 
you know, if I take them off, it'll be all right. I think it happens when you when it's salient. So when it's something that's standing out from the ordinary, when it's got some kind of relevance to, it disturbs your sense of what you can do and who you are. And I think that's something that we often forget too, that um, the way that our bodies function are help to form a representation of who we are and what we can and can't do. Mm. And when that changes, that changes something about who we consider we are. And of course, that is in relation to what we think other people can do and how we see ourselves against other people. So it's that sort of social kind of thing that helps prompt um, when people say, oh, well, I need to do something about it. It's kind of weird. Yeah, um, and, and while you're talking about that and in, in, in your comments previously, I, I just kept popping into my head what's going on with COVID-19 and w what is motivating people to not get tested when they have symptoms, which is, obviously, which is, which is obviously a huge issue. Um, yeah. They don't want to isolate, they don't want to not go to work and allegedly yeah. that's what's driving this problem we've got in Melbourne. So it's obviously very relevant, not just to the foot. And, and also reflecting back on the last top couple of times, I've gone to the doctor myself and the process I went through. So it's not just toe pain. <laughs> it's, it's every, yeah, it's every symptom. At some point we did, we've got, oh, Leventhal has a model called the common sense model. Mm. And, and and what that is about is your illness representation. What do you think is going on? So if you have a sore throat, I can at the moment think, oh, it's hay fever season. We've got nor'westers blowing and I've got, you know, my eyes and mm. nose are streaming. But at the same time, we've got COVID. Christchurch at the moment, we don't. So we're fairly lucky. Um, but elsewhere in the country, if you were in Auckland, you'd be starting to think, oh, hold, hold on. That's, there's something salient about that symptom. It has meaning. And so therefore, I need to do something. But if I'm scared of the consequences, if I think this is going to turn out badly, then I might hold on for a bit. So that common sense understanding of what what is this problem that I think I've got, what does it mean, and what are the implications, it factors into what we do next. And that's very individual, but it's also shaped by what we do in our community. If you were, um, well, way back at the beginning of the COVID thing, if you were Chinese and you had a cold and you were in New Zealand, well, particularly if you're in the States, you'd probably be quite scared to do anything. You'd probably want to hide it. Um, and that's because of how you might be treated. So we think about foot pain or we think about um, feet. If you've got some weird symptom and you think, oh, yuck, that might mean I have some dread disease, what, what would you do? You know, you might be afraid that this is the beginning of the end or you might be enthused to think someone could fix it but often we just hold off and see wait and see think about your own um you know what you do when you've got a cough or a cold or you're just not feeling 100 percent. you just wait to see whether it's going to get in the way i'm just going to pick you back off of craig's google question quickly <laughs> just to talk just to talk about when the we've all seen this and we've all had this several times when a patient comes in and they they, they don't just mention they've been Googling, but they often bring printed printed evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here, here's the yeah. here's the pile of, of research, mm. uh, open quote, close quote that I've done. Yeah. And, and and historically, you know, you, you'd get in the staff room afterwards with your colleagues, and and rightly or wrong, you'd be like, oh my goodness, this person was a nightmare, or you'd 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 yeah. refer to it as a yellow flag. Um, what 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 good what what positive messages can we take from that rather than someone who's coming in saying i've been on dr google i've got this printout i've been doing some research rather than our initial reaction being oh my goodness this person's yeah. intense they're going to be a time sap you know all of it what yeah. positive messages is that per what i mean clearly they care but what more positive how can we spin that in our own minds to say this is a good thing that they're presenting like this well they're interested in in finding out and so that curiosity is a really good sign because it shows they're ready to, to learn. And I guess the way I would handle that, and of course, pain being what it is, people turn up with lots of sheaths of paper. Um, I'd say, so, you know, you've read all of the stuff. What sense do you make of it? What's, what do you think's going on? And use their 
curiosity and, and summarizing because it, it reflects the theory that they've got about what might be happening. And then we can start to unpack that theory and let's test it. Um, and that allows us to collaborate. Instead of us being the sage on the stage saying, what you have is, we can say, hey, I wonder if we could work out what this means for you. Um, and what's the likelihood of this material that you've collected actually applying to you. So I think we can use it in a positive way and we can also guide people. If you're really interested, here's this really cool site and it's got all of this excellent information on it. And that, that's what I tend to do. I'll send people off to Greg Lehman's stuff or um, Adam Meekin's stuff or Ben Cormack's stuff. And, you know, just send them to two places where I know that they're going to get reasonably good information. Um, yeah, I've, because I've, that shows that they're ready for it. Yeah, I've, always had, I've always had this philosophy. If they come in and said they looked it up on Google, um, if every, everyone looks it up on Google, they might not just admit it having done it. So I, yeah. I assume that, and I also assume that whatever I say to them, they're going to go and look up. Absolutely. And, I know sometimes, sometimes lately, if I've got time, I'd say to them, come over here, I sit down on the computer with them and I do a Google search with them and yep. point things out to them. Or this is a trusted source. This is not a trusted source. You don't yep. have that. You've got this because I know they're going to go and do it anyway. We kind of need to because if we think about information and a consumer being somebody who is is able to search and look for things. It just means that instead of us holding all the wisdom and applying it willy-nilly, we've got an informed person. Now, prior to Google, people would have already had their own theory. They just didn't get it from Google. They got it from Auntie Mabel and, and Uncle Joe and, you know, and, and their neighbour. And so we've just got another source. It's just a big source and you can print it out, whereas you can't really print out Auntie Mabel's. <laughs> well, you might, but <laughs> it'll be scary. It'll be onion on your shoes or something. <laughs> that you but, but isn't it speaking about your auntie, but also speaking about, well, not sure Google, but maybe Facebook, is that people are incredibly trusting of advice from people they know. Yes. Yeah. Um, like whether it's in a running shoe group that Ian is very f familiar with, like me, you have people asking for advice all the time, and you get all this advice from other runners, which you know is wrong. You, you bite yeah. your tongue because you don't want to get involved, but they're very trusting of that advice. They are. Um, the study that we did looking at um, using cannabis for pain in people with spinal cord injury, and these guys weren't trusting their doctor or their GP, but they were trusting their herbalist or the lady <laughs> down the road, the green fairy down the road, because they knew. And they didn't even want to talk to the trusted source because they thought they would be judged. And I thought that's interesting. So people may not even share with you their cherished theories because they may think that you will tell them that they're wrong. Who wants to know that? Yeah. So that's why I make the opening of um, let's let's find out what you think is going on. What's your theory? You know, tell me what you've been thinking in your your own mind, and let's have a look at what that might mean. Yeah, we had this study about, I think it was about four or five years ago, that uh, it was a qualitative study of, of where runners were getting the information from. And oh, wow. it showed that runners were more trusting of a running shoe retailer with a treadmill than they were of health professionals. And yep. I thought, you know, wow. You know. Oh, it's got the best of interest, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's, um, can we circle back to the projection of the clinician's assumptions onto the, onto the, onto the sort of uh, patient and... In particular, this one where we always just assume that that pain reduction or pain resolution, complete resolution, is the goal. Now we know that in some presentations that's not even realistically achievable. Um, yeah. But could you could you speak to the research you've done in, in this field and, and and what we can learn from it? So we know that take take my example of me and my my foot. What I'm coming to see a podiatrist for would be, I want to be able to do this tramp without limping at the end of it. I don't want pain reduction right now. And I'm not even worried about it. I want to know that I can do a three day tram up and down Banks Peninsula, which is fairly demanding. And that's, so the way that I look at it is, why is this person presenting in this way at this time? And what's maintaining that? presentation or their predicament and then what can we do to reduce their distress and their disability what's their main concern 
Um, but we assume very often that we're just looking at pain reduction because that's what we were trained to do. You know, we think pain reduction is the thing, but it's actually not. So, yeah, it's um, in terms of research, it's more understanding that we come at this from our with our lens on, and we often we think we're being person centred because if we were that person, we might want to have our pain reduced, but we're not that person, and we are that. If we were imagining ourselves at that person, we we're imagining ourselves with all the knowledge that we've got about what could be going wrong. And of course, we want to look for that weird novel thing that we haven't seen before or that could be there. The person with pain doesn't have that. They just come in saying, hold on, I can't do what I need to do and I'm a bit, bit worried that this pain's not going away or that it means I'm not going to be able to do something in the future. So that meet the therapist moment is when we've got to do some immediate um, sort of meshing. So patients looking at us and that meet the therapist moment. Um, Benedetti has a beautiful idea. So Benedetti is a um, researcher that looks at, he's a neuroscientist looking at, um, at placebo. And he's done some amazing research and it's really his, his model that I use to describe the process of seeking help. And when, it, when we look at the meet the therapist moment, we have this probably within 10 seconds, probably even less, where we're judging that person. As clinician, we're judging the person that we're seeing. And also as clinician, as patient, we see, we're judging the clinician. And from the patient's perspective, what we're looking for is a sense of, can I trust this person? And there's two bits to that. And these also boost this, this meaning response that we can get, so boosts the, the placebo. And there's two bits. One is how warm is this person? Do they express empathy? Do they look like they care for me? And the other one is, do they look competent? <laughs> so, you know, do they look like they know what they're doing? Um, and those two together help to create and, and they frame the relationship that the, we then developed. So as clinicians, what we need to do is to look at that patient and we we judge them as well. We say, can we believe them? Do we think they're telling, are they being straightforward with us? So we're also looking for that sense of trustworthiness. Do I trust you? Are you gonna tell me what I need to know? Um, are, they, are you genuine? And that interaction, that moment is, is a bit of magic really, because we bring all of those assumptions about this person in front of us into what we find out and how we approach finding out information from them. Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. Really yeah. cool. Yeah, and, and the key take home message that I'm hearing here is we've we've got we've got to ask them. We've got to ask them what's important to them. We've got to because actually yeah. pain reduction might be the priority. You know, we, yeah. we know we know it isn't the, the sole reason for everyone, but it doesn't mean it isn't someone's reason, right? So we need to Say, okay, what's important to you? It might be you want pain reduction. It might be you want to know you can do this this hike. It might just be reassurance, for example. Um, yeah. But you but don't no, know. No, it's not diabetic neuropathy or small fibre neuropathy. <laughs> yeah. Well, for but, me, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> but never yeah. assume. Never assume on yeah. their behalf. Always essentially ask them. And, and I think that's something that um, certainly within podiatry we, we, we're hopefully better at than we've ever been. But perhaps it's not something that we we have historically been great at. Um, not something we've been trained to do I think as health professionals we are trained that there is a process that we follow usually it's let's understand the history let's go through our, our examination and, and let's go and do our testing and then we come up with a diagnosis and that's what we focus on but if the person doesn't really care about the name and most people are not the, the name is something they use as a convenient way of communicating to somebody else this is what I've got wrong with me it validates that experience that they're having. But it's more that um, it's that prognosis. What is this going to mean for me? What does it mean in terms of what I can and can't do and the person that I am? And yeah. so yeah. for me, it's, you no. Know, am I am I getting um, osteoarthritis in my toes? <laughs> does this mean I'll never be able to stand for hours in high heels again? I don't mind that, by the way. <laughs> I, <laughs> me neither. Um, I, I, 
I um, I speak to a lot of, of clinicians and some of them have been graduated many years or some of them are, you know, are on uh, post-grad or, or the, perhaps they're just fresh undergrads. And they're just kind of moving into this this model of thinking for want of a better description so they're they're they've sort of been ingrained it's been ingrained within them that you're the specialist you're the fixer people come to see you for solutions and and actually the first time they they meet with this 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 model of thinking it's uncomfortable for them um you know there's that there's that cognitive dissonance of uh, i know that i I always recommend uh, whenever I have a student shadowing me or pre-COVID when I had people shadowing me, I recommend people go on a health coaching course, go on a motivational interviewing course. I know that, that those yeah. those core concepts are incredibly uh, important to you as well. Um, what they come off that course and, and you can see the cognitive dissonance. You can see how uncomfortable they are because it yeah. made such sense, but they, they do not feel comfortable entering the clinic and asking the patient what they think the problem is, because I'm supposed to be the person that tells you what the problem is. Have you got any tips for clinicians of, of any years, number of years experience, how to how to make that step from the fixer to the facilitator, for, uh, if that's the best word to use? I guess the way that I frame it is thinking that we're expert in subject matter. This person's expert in their life and what's important to them. And so if we can't find a way to connect between that, we're going to talk past each other. And you can be as expert as you like in prescribing wonderful orthoses, but if this person actually doesn't care, they'll have spent their time and money doing something that is useless. And then, then they go away feeling disappointed. So it feels like we're using our expertise in a different way. We still need that expertise. We're still drawing on it, but we're focusing it on this, the problem that this person actually wants solved. And it yeah, might, yeah. That's, that's the difference, I think. And it's thinking about who's, who's important in this interaction. It's the person who's coming to see us as clinicians. What we're doing is we're helping them. We're there to care for them. We're there to help them, not to strut our stuff and look, look wonderful. And what we'll do is look wonderful if we help solve the problem that they came to us for, not if we discover another problem that they didn't even care about. That won't make them feel like you're <laughs> wonderful. And it is weird because it's it's a it turns from being um, I'm a dictator and you'll do what I tell you kind of relationship to a dance between two people where where we guide. And in, in dancing, if anyone's done, done, I don't know, ballroom dancing or salsa or something, yes, yeah, somebody does the lead, that's us, but the other person follows. But we have, as a lead, we have to be certain that we're going in the way, in, in a way that mirrors or partners with the person. Otherwise, we'll be dragging this poor person kicking and screaming across the dance floor, which does not look good. So we want to be able to really watch and monitor what's happening with this person so that we can then frame our questions and find out what they really want so yeah it is a it is weird initially it's also liberating because we don't have to be responsible for the outcomes we are there acting as a resource that the person can tap into rather than as an expert that dictates yeah. yeah, it's a shift that just takes a little bit of practice. And what but would your, sorry to, inter sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but um, what would your reply be, or what has it been, because I'm certain you've, been, you've, you've heard this before, to the clinician that says, that's all well and good, I just don't have time to do that in my clinic. Um, and, I, you know, yeah. we, we, all, we all know that, you know, for some reason we have 45 minutes where we decide we can completely appraise this human being biomechanically and set in a management plan in place. But apparently when it comes to unpicking this kind of stuff, um, is it that we don't have the time or is it that we don't have the energy or, or what, what is the, do you believe people that say they don't have the time? And if, if you don't believe them, what is the barrier, the true barrier as to why, why they're not going this way? I think we do have time. And if you've got 45 minutes, you've got plenty of time. I have never heard a patient tell me that somebody listened too much, <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. In fact, what they say is they didn't listen to me. 
And they'll say that of people who have lots of time and people who have little time. So I think it's a change for us about saying, recognising, I don't know if you guys are trained in the way that physios do, but they call it the subjective and then they do the objective. And the subjective bits, the bit that's a bit wishy-washy, we'll just pop that over there because it actually doesn't matter because the real work is when we do the objective. But that subject is this person explaining their situation, what they're looking for. And valuing that part is probably more important than coming up with any diagnosis. Because if they don't think that they've been listened to or heard or understood, they're going to walk away and say, well, he didn't listen to me. Why would I do what he wants? Because he doesn't know what, what's really my situation, what I'm le looking for. So, and the, the other thing is that if you spend all this time coming up with your diagnosis and your treatment and the person walks away and doesn't do it, doesn't wear those orthotics, doesn't do the exercise, what a waste particularly if they're paying for it themselves. <laughs> um, actually, I can remember, Bronnie, way back in my undergraduate years, the same place that you trained, um, one of the uh, older clinicians in that time saying, um, always listen to your patient, they will tell you the diagnosis. And it yeah. was a very, very long time ago, and things haven't exactly changed much. <laughs> Not, no, and yet we've been able to ignore that very real fact that people know what's going on in their bodies they know how it feels they can tell us everything that we really need to know but then we think oh no we've gone to school we're very very smart we went mm. to CIT for how many years <laughs> and we learned all the stuff yeah. and we should be able to figure it out through some kind of I don't know um, ESP or something because we're very very smart but actually people they will tell you stuff if you're prepared to listen to it but it might not be as organised in the way that you want. And it might prioritise things that you wouldn't necessarily prioritise. But if they've prioritised it, either it's because they think you need to know, because they've got assumptions about what you do, or because it's really important to them. Mm -hmm. But people don't always tell us everything. And that's why we've got that interviewing skill. Open-ended questions allow more stuff to come out then if we say and where does it hurt sure we're we not we're we not at risk of going further the other way because there's a huge push at the moment to um point of care ultrasound both within physiotherapy and within podiatry um and that's growing at quite quite a rapid rate at the moment is that not a risk of pushing back the other way yeah i mean point of care ultrasound and any gadget is going to get exciting people excited about it oh shiny machine that goes bing yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a thing we like our toys and I think it does start to push us towards thinking that if we do things to people that's mm. going to do the trick but you've only got this 45 minutes they've got mm. the rest of the day and the rest <laughs> of the week to live with it and to do stuff that follows up with it and I don't know even when you're doing a, a treatment like that people still have to do something with it when they leave you it's not just, a, I'm, I'm doing this and you walk away and you're cured. You've got to be able to feel confident as a patient that you can start to do more if you've had a treatment. So you've got to follow up. And that's the bit that I think we disconnect from. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, this person won't just do what you say because otherwise we'd all be slim exercise people who don't smoke and don't drink, right? <laughs> I don't smoke, but, you know, the drinking I'm not, I'm going to confess to. Um, thing. <laughs> we, I definitely want to come back to how we can use all of this information and understanding to, to be better clinicians. But I want to pivot sort of slightly. I, I just wouldn't, I just never forgive myself if I had you here and I didn't ask you about the work that sort of embodied your PhD, which is how, you know, about people living with pain. And I think it's pertinent because we know that some people, um, live live with pain, you know, persistent pain, and other people, you know, don't don't cope with it or cope it. Cope, is cope or live a better word? I'm not too sure, but I mean, I think this feeds into why some people seek treatment sooner than later, or why mm. some people, if if they don't get a good uh, clinical outcome because of an interaction with a with a professional, it will feed back into what sort of cope they are. So, would you mind? Uh, and I always feel so guilty asking someone to briefly summarise that uh, uh, an entire lifetime's work, but. Could you just 
could you just give uh, our listeners a real intro into um, if you want to talk about the, the you know the grounding theory you did, but you know what are the characteristics of people that that seem to cope or live better with pain that, than not? Oh, thank you. That's 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 the paper. And um, so I was intrigued by people who live well with pain because working as a chronic pain clinician, um, I don't know how many hours of listening to people saying, "Oh, it's awful, and I can't sleep, and I can't do anything." And then I I live with a man who lives with ankylosing spondylitis, and he until he got onto Humira, um, now it must be about twelve years ago. He had terrible inflammation and his um, inflammatory markers were skyrocketing and it wasn't managed well with the anti-inflammatories at the time. And yet he was a high country firefighter in his spare time. So in the mountains here, you, as a high country firefighter, you are climbing with a, a pack, you're dragging a, um, these big um, hoses, you, you're digging out stumps. It's really hard, hard yakka. And he was still doing that and working full time. And I thought, this is really weird. He's got pain such that in the middle of the night, I, we, we actually used a sliding sheet to roll him because it, the pain got into his um, intercostals and they were really inflamed and he couldn't cough and stuff like that. And there he was still doing this really vigorous stuff and I couldn't figure it out. So I thought, let's find out. <laughs> Why not? It's a good idea, isn't it? First of April was the day I enrolled for my PhD. I should have known <laughs> um, because then I got concussion. But anyway, we won't we won't go. Into that. Um, but oh, and then we had the earthquakes. So so the timing for my PhD was a disaster, really. But I had also seen in, the, in media reports um, people who were athlete, athletes gold medal athletes, people who did, you know, high level sports and they said, well, you know, I've got ankylosing spondylitis or I've got a back pain or I've had, and I was thinking, how, how come? So I recruited people who self-reported that they were living well, despite having a rheumatological condition. I started with rheumatological, fairly clear cut things, and then worked on from there to say, you know, people with slightly more weird things like hypermobility, Ellis Danlos, those sorts of conditions where um, the diagnosis is not as easy to come up with. And what I found was that, that people aren't different, they're not magically different, there doesn't seem to be a personality characteristic. It's a process that people have gone through. And the first stage of getting to feel okay about pain is making sense of what's going on. And making sense is a process of getting a name for naming this thing that you've got. And that's really useful, not because it gives you a, um, a prognosis. It's, it's nice and convenient shorthand for saying to people, this is what's wrong with me. So I can say fibromyalgia to people and they know widespread body pain and fatigue and rotten sleep. And it's quite, it's convenient. It comes with a lot of baggage as well, but that's actually still part of what people are looking for. So people want a name. Um, it also means that it's not a mystery. It's not weird. It's got, it's a known entity. And that uncertainty is something people are really looking into. The second part of making sense is, is working out the meaning. What does this mean I can and can't do? What's the impact on me? Um, how can I predict what um, what effect this is going to have on a bad pain day? What can I do despite my pain? And that's a very personal thing, and we don't seem to do very much to help people with this process. There doesn't seem to be um, a, a clinician that will sit and work with people to help them work out. So when you have a flare-up, what can you do? What makes a flare-up happen? Um, we just kind of assume that people know that. But there's a kind of working out, what, is, what does this actually mean for me? And the third part is a sort of a process of um, just existing during this making meaning um, sense. It, it's that time where I'm just trying to keep things together. So how can I sleep? How can I keep my job going? Um, how can I keep the things that matter to me going, care for my kids, that sort of stuff. 
So people at that stage, um, this is often when we'll see people and they're in that stage, they're not quite ready to tip over into future thinking. But it, after people have got kind of an understanding of the meaning of what, what this problem that I've got that's hanging around a bit actually means, for some people, they have this desire to get engaged in doing something important, something that makes them feel like themselves. And it's a positive drive. Um, so people in my study were, one guy was a guy in his 60s who had, um, he had been told he had osteoarthritis when he was quite young, like 19 or 20, and he was a rugby player. And he was told, don't, don't play rugby. He was absolutely gutted. And he told me that for some years, he didn't do any rugby at all. And then, because, you know, rugby players, being rugby players, have to go and do rugby. So he, he decided, well, if this is the way it's going to be, I'm going to get involved anyway. So he found a way to get involved in rugby. And so he brought out the oranges at half time for the kids. And he was he was a coach. So he, he did line refereeing and you know stuff like that that he could still get involved in it. And so there seems to be a process in here where people say, this thing that I've got, if I can find another way to do the thing that I that matters to me, then I will do that as long as I can fit it inside the my capabilities at the moment. And in doing that, people flip over into a process that is called flexibly persisting. And this is over time, people start to say, well, if I need to, this guy was saying, well, if I, if I want to play rugby, I want to go play, um, he was playing master's rugby. He actually wasn't playing the time I saw him because he tackled somebody and he'd hurt his shoulder and he was having surger, surgery for his shoulder. But it wasn't his, his OA knees that was causing the problem. Um, but he he said, you know, I worked out what I needed to be able to do. I developed coping strategies to help me do what was important. And a lot of time in pain management will offer people coping strategies without tying those strategies to what it is the person actually wants to do. So he was saying, as I started to do this rugby stuff, I realised I needed to get fitter. I realised I needed to learn how to handle my pain by using yoga and meditation. Um, and then, so there's this coping sort of strategies that people develop. And in that, people in, who, who, who live well, they, they notice their pain, but they're not judging it as something that's really scary. They say, oh, it's just noise, because it's like it's familiar. It is just, that's what I, what my body does. And so they've recognized that it's not an indication of, uh, I need to stop, but it's an indication that my body's a bit cranky, but I don't need to really worry too much about it. Um, so that fear that it means, the pain means something harmful, cancer or uh, my body's deteriorating, he's gone. So somebody spent some time helping to explain that. And sometimes it's the diagnosis. But oftentimes it was what my participants called a trustworthy clinician. And that was somebody who, who was willing to stand beside them and wave the flag for them as they tried stuff out for themselves. So this chap in particular liked his coloured lights. I've no idea what coloured lights do, but he, he would sit there faithfully at the end of each day underneath the coloured lights, green and red. Um, and some somebody, one of the clinicians had said, well, if that, if that helps you, why don't you give that a go? And I thought, I'm not sure that I would have done that. But because that clinician was prepared to, to wave him on and say, yes, of course, have a go, see what it's like for you. It's like the clinician trusting that this person was going to make a choice that fitted for them, showing that trust in the person then he felt good about it. The other thing that trustworthy clinicians do is they check up on people. They do little acts of caring. And that could be um, different people in the study showed that it might have been, I've, I've looked up this thing on the internet for you. And look, look, this might be about you. Um, they, when they were giving out a set of exercises, you know, an exercise sheet, they'd cross off the ones that don't apply and they'd say, hey, these are the ones that you should be doing they'll do you really, really well. Or they ring up 
or they'd send a text to say, hey, we tried this, how's it going for you? So there were little acts of kindness and caring that showed that this person mattered. And I thought that was really cool. So that was part of, that was a factor in helping people move from trying to make sense into feeling confident enough to engage in what mattered in their lives. And then once you're in flexible, flexibly persisting and you've got some coping and you, you're trying to um, start to get engage in your occupations, so doing things that matter, then people can start to, to do future planning. And it's like, I think sometimes in pain management, people jump in and start to say, what do you want to be able to do? And this person's thinking, oh my God, all I want to be able to do is sleep tonight, thanks. Not, I want to go for a marathon. They're just not ready for it. So we've got to be guided a little bit by where people are at in the stage of um, adjusting and adapting to living with this thing. Once people are in that flexibly persisting phase, it seems like they'll go, a new pain might come along and they'll still use the, that same process of making sense, of trying to get a name for it, and then they'll get back on and do what matters in their lives. Yeah. Very cool. Actually, yeah, just, very. just one comment you, you, you said there, Bronnie, and I'm not sure I, I picked it up correctly, but the, you talked about the, the colored lights and we don't know what they do, yeah. but try it anyway. And, and what popped into my head when you said that was I've had patients come to me who have, they live somewhere else and they told me, oh, yeah, this is what they did for me. And under my breath, I thought, my God, that is so incompetent. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that, that other clinician obviously has no idea what they were doing to recommend that. And you've got to bite your tongue and be careful how you phrase it. And now with Facebook, someone asks for advice online, that person comes along and says, oh, yeah, these colored lights are wonderful. And But then you'll get people saying, don't be so stupid. And yeah. Isn't there a danger in that? There is. And, and there are some very um, unscrupulous people who are making money out of vulnerable people. And I, I object strongly to that. So if you're a, you know, a, somebody who sells stuff um, or processes and then hooks people into stuff knowing that it is not, it doesn't work. I think that's worrying, but the difference with this is that this person sorted out for themselves. Mm -hmm. And what I ask them is, what was it like for you? What's your experience of it? I'm not validating. I'm just saying, what's it like for you? Does, how does it help? What's good about it? What's not so good? And I do that across the board with every type of intervention, whether it's something that's conventional or something that's not. Because even conventional things, and I'm thinking about exercise and everybody knows that I do not like the gym. I hate the gym. Um, and people think, you know, gym works, fantastic for pain. You should all be doing it. But there are good things about the gym. Yes, it's a nice routine. It's it's a place where you can go and you've got the machinery and get, you know, everybody's dedicated to doing the workout. The not so good parts of the gym are that it's not always convenient. It's full of people dressed in lycra sweating. <laughs> it's just really in metal and, and pumping music. And I just hate that atmosphere and it's expensive. And so, you know, you can think about different ways to do that. So I think with, um, with gadgets, I'm not validating the use. I'm just saying, if you if you want to try it, have a try and then see what it's like for you and look at the good and the not so good about it. And mainly I'll point out, you know, people will know the good parts, but then it's also useful to help them reflect on the not so good parts. For the coloured lights, it probably works because he's sitting quietly for half an hour with a warm light on him. You know, it's funny that Craig picked up on that comment because when you were talking, that was the comment that sprung out to me. And I was I was basically reflecting on myself. I'm and in the quest for being, and I'm sure I'm not the only one guilty of this, in the quest for being evidence-based or evidence-informed, as soon as I hear something that sounds like pseudoscience or hokum, I'll, I'll, I have in the past been very quick to tell the patient that. And, 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 quite clearly been guilty of not standing by their side and waving the flag for them. So yeah, that was the comment that jumped out to me as well, how we tread that line between being an ethical evidence-informed clinician, but also 
showing the patient that we trust them to make decisions. Yeah, I guess it, it, there is a point at which somebody's deliberating, should I try this? In which case I'd be saying, so let's weigh it up. Here's the good things about it, here's the not so good things. So that's a motivational interviewing technique. And what I'm trying to do at that point is stand back from giving an opinion. And I'm saying, you know, my understanding is that there's no real evidence for this to work. But at the same time, you're the person who's got to make the decision. You're the person who's spending the money. And these are the good things that we know, and these are the not so good things. And where does that leave you? What decision do you want to make? And I think that might be an ethical way of dealing with it. Um, because when I look at the evidence and the effect sizes of things for chronic pain, they're pretty dire. Across the board, they're awful. You know, psychosocial strategies are minimal effect, um, effect sizes. Pharmaceuticals, really poor. Uh, you know, exercise changes pain by very little and disability by very little. So really what we are about in chronic pain management often is this idea of this person finding a, a collection of strategies that works for them. It's individualized. And in a way, knowing that nothing much works very well is kind of liberating because it means that we can't say no to anything either. And neither can we say, oh, you better do this and you better not do that. And it gives us a much, much more lib liberty to say, you tailor make something. And it gives us much more responsibility to monitor the impact. Yeah. And is it working? And then the only way we can tell whether it's working is if we ask that person, what do you notice? And that puts the self-efficacy, it builds their self-efficacy that they are making decisions that work for them. And I think that's um, important because we want people to feel confident that they're doing the right thing. Yeah. It sounds to me like some of a lot of the... Uh, commonality between the people that your 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 sub your participants that were living well was they they weren't conflating pain with damage they were accepting that pain was a normal part of life pain is yeah. is not optional but the but distress is optional um yeah. are there are there things that we as clinicians can do to sort of encourage you know we we often think that if we just educate people about pain then then that will work we know that doesn't that, that isn't as simple as that are there things that we can do that can get them there or do they have to ultimately get there themselves at their own at their own pace i really think a lot of it is about um a person going through a process of of letting go of some things and acquiring new things and the letting go part says suffering so we've got pain right and we've got suffering pain's pain we know that experience um, intimately most of us but the suffering part we often conflate and we think that if somebody has pain they must be suffering and that's why I don't like that word used when oh this patient suffers from fibromyalgia well maybe not so suffering is the impact on a sense of self and I'm quoting Eric Castles here who's a, a wonderful writer who talks about suffering and, and in that is this loss of sense of self who am I and I think we can help people live with pain if we can help them see they can still have essences of who they are. And that's so that I'm thinking about our rugby playing dude. He, he saw himself as somebody who plays rugby. That was part of who he was. And as long as he could express that sense of I'm a guy that plays rugby, he was as happy as a sand boy even if he did hurt his shoulder. <laughs> and, and we often forget that that stretched sense of self is, is probably the thing that starts to push people to come and seek treatment. They see themselves as this person who should be fit and should be active, and this intruder has taken over. So if we can help people see that there are, they can still get those aspects of self back, they, they can let go of some things like the belief that there is only one way to be a rugby enthusiast you know and that's to play professional rugby well that only happens to a small number of people 
Um, but we can see that there are other ways that people can express that same element of who they are. And that seems to help people shift across. The other part is helping people um, being willing to do things that hurt if they're part of um, something that matters to them. So I, I don't know if you guys have heard, but I talk, I work a lot with guys that ride motorbikes. I have no idea why. And motorcyclists are a you unique. You don't know why you work with them or you don't know why they ride motorbikes. Oh, well, I'm an ex-motorcyclist. So, you know, and I have I have a Honda Cub sitting in my in my garage in bits and it will be repaired. Um, it was supposed to be repaired by the middle of this year to do a, we do a, um, the trip from, from Christchurch to Greymouth through, through Arthur's Pass on Honda 90s. <laughs> 90cc. <laughs> so, so I get it. I understand it. Um, but I do tend to work with with blokes who who have a passion for something, and I ask. I often ask them. So, have you done the, whatever it is? Gone for a ride on your bike, and have you come back? And what's it been like? Oh, I had this really big flare up, and then I will ask them, and was it worth it? And you watch their face, and it's yeah, it was. Fishermen are just the same, you know. I went out for a day's fishing or all wheel driving, you know. This is key, true Kiwi behavior, as you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> go and do this manly kind of stuff, and and they feel guilty because they shouldn't have, you know, they've been told by so many people you shouldn't do this thing that matters to you because it's going to increase your pain. They do it and they come back buzzing, and yes, they're sore but it doesn't matter. In the pursuit of things that matter to us, we're prepared to do stuff that hurts. Ask anybody who, who works out in a gym or goes who does running. I've never seen a runner look happy at the end of their run until they've stopped. <laughs> you know, they're looking exhausted, but they're happy. It's a bit like bashing your head against a brick wall. That always feels good when you stop. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea why people run. I don't do that. I do other stuff. That idea that um, if you're doing something that hurts, are you willing to experience a change in your pain, maybe an increase in your pain, if you're doing something that matters to you, is one of the things that seems to help people shift across into, and it is worth it. Um, one of the guys that I talked to in my PhD is a, is a racing car driver. And he'd had juvie um, arthritis, and he t he said he was a blimp. He you know when he was a kid, he just hated exercise. It hurt so much. But he wanted to be a racing car driver, and to be a racing car driver, V8 driver, you've got to be fit. Mm -hmm. And so he said, if I want to do that, I'm going to have to go to the gym. I'm going to have to suck it up, and he did, because it was worth it. And I think sometimes we forget to look for the. And we tell people you need to do it because it's good for you. We forget that there's a reason that people want to do it. They want to do it so they can do this other really important thing that helps to reduce the sense of suffering and bring and the pain seems to be less relevant. It's cool, isn't it? Very it's really, cool. it's, it kind um, of rocks your world, though. It's like we, it's not um, what we were taught. No, yeah, it's it's cool but uncomfortable. But I like I like yeah. uncomfortable. Um, we're just about to hit the hour, so I think we're going to try and round things up. Um, I just want to make sure that the that people that are listening have got things that they can sort of you know action or go and read or or think about doing. We we've already Craig's already put in the comments a link to your PhD, your grounding theory paper. He's put a yeah. link uh, to your blog, which I would massively encourage people to read. Bronnie, Bronnie writes brilliant blogs. Um, people can find you. I think you're most active. I think I'm right in saying on Facebook uh, rather yeah. than Instagram yeah. or, or Twitter. Um, if you go final... on Instagram, you'll find my silversmithing yeah. and my dog. <laughs> which is, which is <laughs> great. Um, just, 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 before, just before you go, what are, you know, how do we take all of this, this life's work of yours and this ongoing work and, and you know, and how do we just become better clinicians? What are the top three things for us to be a bit less shit in clinic on Monday morning? Um, if, if you could narrow it possibly down to three for the for the new undergrad, for the clinician that says, right, I want to stop making assumptions and, and do better by my patients. What are the big three? I think the first thing is to trust your patient. 
trust that they know their experience really well. They know what matters to them. They know their body. They understand what's happening. They don't have labels for it and they may freak out. But actually they are the ones that, they are the only ones that can tell you what it feels like and what, what their priorities are. And that, the second point is that if that's the case, if we trust our patients, then the second part is to, then we need to create some space for them to be able to tell us and to be willing to listen and that, and to show people that we're listening by reflecting. So when they tell us, um, you know, I've had this really sore foot and I'm, I'm doing silversmithing, we can say, so it, it sounds like you're really struggling by the end of a day. And that's telling the person that you've heard them. And then you might extend that a little bit and say, and, and it sounds like you're a bit worried that you might not be able to keep doing that. So just that reflective listening um, is a clear indication that you are listening to this person, and you're hearing them. And then the third, third thing then is to know that, yes, you've got this body of knowledge, but if you just dump it on people, they will not listen. So be selective in when you're listening to what this person cares about, what you then collaborate with them to do, and it's offering them something. It's not dumping it, it's saying, here, here are some things that I could offer you, and we can work together to work out if this is helping. So it's very much more collaborating than being that expert. And yet you're using, probably working harder to use your expertise than if you were just dumping it on them. And you're talking to an OT who used to give out raised toilet seats to anybody who had a <laughs> hip replacement because that was what I was taught to do whether they wanted it or not. So yeah. I've come a long way from being in that, that space to realise that some people actually didn't need the raised toilet seat. They had alternative strategies. And so do some of your patients, even if it's coloured lights. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank Bronnie. Thank you yeah, so look, much. Yeah, no, thank, thanks so much, Bronnie. Um, yeah, the hour's Absolutely. gone really, really quickly. So for those that have joined late, come back in half an hour. The video will be there. It'll be up on YouTube later today. So, so thanks again, Bronnie. Absolute pleasure. Good to talk to you guys.